Hi everybody, it's Tuesday. I'm back in my HQ. Things in the wrong place. But uh, I have something great to show you guys based on the War on Stupid Tour. Um, I got viced. I got viced. Let me give you a bit of background. When we were starting, when we were uh, preparing for the Toronto show on um, Friday, last Friday, um, the, uh, the v Vice wants to interview, all right, at the show, which, which means that we're not going to get any advance press from Vice. It's going to benefit them in terms of clicks and not benefit us at all. So it's like, mm. but it wasn't my call. Um, then they want to interview you separately. Ding, 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 hatchet piece in the making. That's usually, uh, a, uh, an indicator. And so that didn't end up happening. But then the guy shows up. He's this unassuming, I guess he's a mixed race dude. He kind of Asian, kind of Spanish, but, uh, um, you know, nice guy. Uh, we talked for, I don't know, 20 minutes, um, before the show. So it's eating into our prep for the show to talk to media. We're being really good about this. Um, and then uh, they come back, take pictures after the show. And I notice they're focusing on, on Ed the Sock, not me. They sort of click, 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 click. And then they want all these ones of Ed on his own, right? Um, that's usually a sign that the piece is going to be Ed the Sock and Leanna Kay. And, um, oh, I was right. But uh, I think the... The real victory here is they couldn't hatch at us that badly. And I think the finished product shows more about sort of the weaknesses and ironically the lack of relevance of Vice than it does about us. And But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the article with you guys and tell you the real story behind the comments so you can see how things were um, played up, played down, how certain things are outright misleading, how certain things are completely misrepresented. Oh, and uh, we had to redo the second half of the interview the next day in the car while we were driving to Ottawa because the guy's tape recorder stopped working halfway through. So we helped him out for a piece that benefited us not at all because we were being nice and tried to help out kind of, you know, an up and coming ambitious kid in journalism. And this was the result. Ed the Sock is back, but who is he in 2019? So this big defender of Progressive Values Vice magazine doesn't include the woman in a duo comedy act. It's all just focused on the, the, the male character. Uh, the puppet is peak 90s Canadiana, but now he's back as a political act making jokes about SJWs and the alt-right. Um, the biggest period for Ed the Sock was like 99 to 2004. That was uh, the time I was co-hosting the show and the ratings were the highest, but it was also when Fromage, the show that... Um, skewered music videos was at its peak so it was more sort of the the ed phenomenon was really more early aughts than 90s for some odd reason pe people keep saying it's 90s it's 90s maybe because there's a 90s revival going on right now and it squeezes into the mandate fine but you know accurate is accurate it was sort of yes ed was on tv during the 90s but Ed was also on TV during the 80s. The big boom was 99 onward when we took over Fromage. On a cold Friday night, I find myself leaning against the sticky black walls of a dingy, low-lit venue in Toronto's West End. A mix of the retro rock pumped through the stage's PA system as people found a place to sit. Canada Goose Parkers and Hell's Angels jackets were slung next to one another on the backs of beer-stained seats. At some point, it dawned on me, we're all here to watch an adult puppet show. We were here to see Ed the Sock. Um, they were here to see Ed the Sock and, and, and me, 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 my, my, me. I, I was half the act. Gee, what does this sound like? You're totally erasing a woman's participation. Some people would call that sexist. Just, just saying. Now, I should be clear. This was a metal bar. This was a place that was best known for metal bands. Now, that's very important based on how it looked, but also the, the crowd it draws, and that comes up later, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. 
The green-haired, cigar-smoking puppet grew to fame on Canada's Much Music. He represented all things weird and dear to Canada during the 90s and early, two th and early thousands. He interviewed everyone from Mark Hoppus to Mark Hamill. He sang backstage with Destiny's Child and even crafted a flirtatious report with a young Avril Lavigne. Uh, that sounds bad. And that's sort of not totally accurate. But um, the uh, Ed didn't start on Much Music. Ed started on a little tiny cable station called Newton Cable, moved over to Rogers Cable when Newton Cable was purchased, then went on to City TV, then went on to Much Music. So Ed ended up on Much Music after Ed was pretty much already locally famous. He didn't grow to fame on Much Music. You'd think a crack reporter with a woke and relevant... Um, uh, you know, reader base would, would get that right. When he wasn't interviewing musicians, he was hosting Ed and Red's Night Party on City TV. You notice it's Ed's and Red's Night Party, but he made it sound like he hosted it alone. My name is right in the show, dude. And you erased me. And you're going to get on me on my politics and my relevance? Go back to 1998 and the Doug Ford sex ed curriculum. There's an issue here. Yes, I, I went there. I feel it's warranted. You'll see why later. Um, hosted Edward's Night Party on City TV, a variety show where B-list celebrities soaked in a hot tub with topless women while Ed and co-host Leanna Kay conducted nonsense interviews. Sometimes there were blow-up dolls. There was one blow up doll nonsense interviews okay it was a comedy show it was a comedy variety show we didn't really interview anyone in studio we went to LA and you know if you think Mark Hamill and Stan Lee are B-list celebrities all right dude more power to you. I wouldn't call them B-list. Mark Hamill's a pretty big name. The celebrities didn't go in the hot tub. Those were regular people. We called it the wank tank, and it was uh, an interesting experiment in power transfer that all oh, these big guys were really like, oh, big dudes until they got in there, and then they just shrunk because the, the women in that they knew how to control the situation. It was very, very interesting. Um, I always found it very funny. And and here we go. The um, Though Stephen Kersner, the man behind the puppet, isn't exactly what you'd expect, short, softly spoken, and on the surface somewhat reserved. Um, I should point out that the reporter himself was short, softly spoken, and on the surface somewhat reserved. So I don't know what my husband's appearance has to do with anything, you jerk. Um, what does his height have to do with anything. Why did you go there? That's just, it's just petty. It's just, for a while he identified as conservative. Oh my God, in the 80s. Idolizing the likes of Thatcher and Reagan, you can, you can tell how long ago it was. Since then he's denounced his right-wing leanings in favor of a centrist view. He hasn't actually denounced it. He just, his views, ma mainly, it's less that his views changed, but the center shifted just just for... And everybody's going, what? I know, right? Like me? Yeah, people are not simple. I was... I, I You guys know I'm pretty left wing. So that was accurate, but the whole denounced thing, I don't know. I That would be up to my, my husband to deal with, but... Like most Canadians who grew up in the 90s, I was raised on much music. It's why, what I binge watch before the ad advent of YouTube or Netflix. Music videos, live performance, tree tosses, award shows, and of course, Ed the Sock. But whenever Ed made an appearance, I was told to change the channel. He was too crass a commentator for my preteen ears. Sooner or later, Ed became someone I looked forward to watching, if not because he was hilarious, then because the thrill of hiding it from my family made it even more exciting. And this is the thing about Canadian reporters who grew up watching Ed the Sock. They are some of the most likely people to get passive aggressive and kind of nasty when they write. It's, it's a really weird phenomenon. They, Canadian reporters, for whatever reason, love to show their, their hard hitting by taking down the people, you know, they, they admired growing up. I don't know why, 
But if you're a fan of somebody, why would you misrepresent them? Like, why would you misrepresent them at all as a journalist? But why would you misrepresent them in the negative? And that does eventually happen. Um, switch. There we go. Um, in the 10 years he's been off the air, Ed has fired shots at Much Music, co-hosted this short-lived Ed's Night In, and launched the FU Network on YouTube with his wife, Leanna. Did you catch that? Ed has a wife. Not, my husband has a wife, not the creator the sock puppet has a wife. No, he doesn't. How do you get that wrong? Okay. Um, now, nearly two decades since this all began, I find myself sitting in a room watching him crack jokes at the expense of SJWs, the alt-right, hotel bed stains, and cucumbers. That's accurate, but that wasn't the whole show. Here we go. I was skeptical of who he was trying to appeal to. The audience was made up of people in their late 20s to 50s. So did you see what Vice just did there? They took broad appeal, okay? People bought tickets to see this show. And the age range, there were people older than 50 there, okay? And there were definitely people in their 20s. Vice just took broad appeal, a character who is as relevant to 20-something millennials as he is to the Gen Xers that started watching him and made it into a bad thing. Made it into, we were, oh, sorry, he was. I, once again, don't exist, right? You see the he, 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 not they? Erasure of female presence? Fuck off, Vice. You've got big problems with women and you should be doing better than this after all the sexual harassment scandals you've had to endure. Sorry, Kate. I swore. I'm sorry. I'm angry. I apologize. Um, so the, turning, like we, we were trying to appeal to a specific demographic. That is not how entertainment works. Entertainers don't go, I want 30 something black lesbian women. That's what advertisers do entertainers go, whoever wants to come see my show, I'm happy to have them. I want people who want to buy tickets, but oh, right. I have nothing to do to it. It's apparently just a solo act with the pronoun he, I wasn't there. While it was a slightly more diverse crowd than I expected, most of them are white, the majority of them men, some of them rough around the edges. So instead of going, yeah, there were actually people of color at a metal bar. It was a heavy metal bar. Vice Magazine decides to remark on the fact that precisely the guys you'd expect to see, well, it's precisely the people you'd expect to see at a metal bar were at a metal bar. Instead of looking at it like, oh, they drew from outside the red, and the place was packed. Like they were lined up outside the, uh, outside the, I was, it was in the dressing room and, and I, I, I'll, I'll blank it because I'm sorry, Kate. But it's like, I heard two guys, two workers like, there's a huge effing line out there, eh? Who the F's here? That's a huge effing line. Like they were just, they were astounded at, at the crowd. There were so many people there. And, you know, the fact that we drew from beyond, because this place was, it wasn't right downtown. And it was sort of in a, in a sort of industrial commercial area. So people had to make quite a trip in the cold to see us. And, oh, it was slightly more diverse than I expected. So it exceeded your expectations, dude. And once again, you turned it into a negative. Now, this part did happen. But so when Ed asked us for a definition of political correctness, actually, Ed didn't. I did. I asked that question. Thank you very much. So when Ed asked us for the definition of political correctness and someone from the front row, who I could only describe as that guy, yelled pussies, I wasn't surprised. You know what I said in response to that? Because we expect that sometimes. I went, okay, so this guy likes cat videos. Um, so cat videos are politically incorrect. Stick handled it, moved on. No, I don't get any credit for that. I didn't even ask the question. I apparently wasn't there, according to Vice Magazine. And Vice Magazine seeks to judge us and our wokeness and our diversity and all this stuff, you have made this performance less diverse than it actually was by erasing the woman involved. Um, the, they intersperse discussions of nuance with punchlines like, do you see how they blew past 
the discussions of nuance. I'll read the whole thing and then I'll give you the context for this statement because you guys are going to love this. They intersperse discussions of nuance with punchlines like cocksuckers do good work. One minute he talked about outrage culture, the next he was calling Bill Maher a douchebag. Near the end, we were looking at a slideshow of dicks on a projector. Okay, so here's what actually happened there. This is probably the most misleading paragraph in a, in a fairly misleading article. Um, you notice they didn't mention the discussions of nuance. Those discussions of nuance included uh, LGBTQ plus issues, uh, including actually educating the audience on trans trans issues, trans terminology, why you say this and not that. And I'm not repeating the words because some people find them offensive. And so people were like nodding and they're like, oh, okay, that's why you do it. That makes sense to me. We were talking about, you know, um, uh, indigenous team mascots, things like that. Uh, I don't remember if we did the black, the white kids wearing Black Panther Halloween costumes in that show, but that's the nuance that they didn't cover. They just decided they were going to reference it, but not focus on it. Because this article very clearly had an agenda based on the way it was written, and they were not gonna give us credit for any vice points. They, they somehow decided that this was an anti-vice thing, and they were gonna make us look as bad as possible. The cocksuckers do good work thing was an examination of why cocksucker is an insult at all since fellatio is an extremely enjoyable activity. Um, and the Bill Maher is a douchebag thing happened after we ran the interview we did um, when Stanley was 84 years old and he is so smart and funny and quick and the man is beloved and Bill Maher decided to take a crack at Stanley. That is why Ed called Bill Maher a douchebag. It was in reference to that. Um, and the slideshow of dicks. This, you guys are going to love this. That was a bit about men who send women unsolicited dick pics on, on the internet. It's a bit designed to make guys laugh, but at the end kind of feel uncomfortable about the whole phenomenon. And it starts with the women kind of feeling uncomfortable. They were talking about the issue at all. Apparently some woman got triggered and left and I said, wow, I'm surprised she lasted that long at that show. Um, but it starts off about, uh, you know, why guys do it. And then we're like, guys, you got to step up your game. And so it's basically a bunch of um, penises in costumes. But the audience laughs every time. The bit kills. That's why it's near the end of the show. But at the end, and I'm not going to spoil it for people who haven't seen this show yet, it's something that sort of turns it on and by the end, all the women are laughing and nodding and the guys are like kind of uncomfortable. And that's how you kind of know which guys. Um, and it's always very interesting because it's always like, um, who sent pictures of your dick to a woman who didn't ask for it? And maybe two hands will come up in an incredibly honest audience. Um, you know, a, a guy at the back usually goes, woo, you know, just to be, he's having fun. Um, and then it's always women, you know, who's been sent one of these pictures. And of course, practically every female hand in the room goes up and you see the guys kind of looking around like, really? It's, it's an interesting little bit of like empathy exercise. And so then we show these pictures of, um, like a where's Waldo penis and a Terminator penis. And they don't, they barely look like penises anymore. That's the whole point. So this, this image they're painting of, oh, it's just penis, 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 penis. That's not what it is at all. The way they presented this is utterly and totally misleading and totally misrepresents what the bit was doing. We were 100% on the side of the women who send these pictures. And you know, ladies, wouldn't you prefer these pictures? And every woman in the room goes, yes, right? And then it goes on from there. That's not obviously how this article represented that experience. It's completely misleading. So here we go. This is the part I, I loved. I wondered, is Ed relevant anymore? Let's break this down. We had hundreds of people in a 
in a suburban Toronto location, not right, not right down, down, the suburbs, hundreds of people, 250 people estimate. Um, in winter, like the weather's miserable here, okay? In winter, paying money to see us, oh, sorry, Ed, because Ed's the only one that matters here, according to Vice, but paying to see Ed, is that even real? Uh, and then, and then Vice wants to come day of the show. Well, Vice, you wanted to come. Is Ed relevant anymore? Yes, he's relevant. That's why you want to cover him. Like, this, this is not philosophy. This is not Descartes, okay? This is not a man, well, this might actually be Immanuel Kant, uh, Kant asking questions that actually already have the answers. He just wants to make the answer far more complicated than it actually is. Um, but is that even relevant? You're covering him. The only reason you're covering him is because he's still relevant. Stop the faux intellectualism. It's embarrassing to you. So here's more um, uh, misleading stuff. I listened as he used outdated pop culture references. SCTV, Gilbert Godfrey, and Moby, to name a few. Now, I made the Gilbert, Godfrey, and Moby references. One was, I said, do you notice that for a while there, every person who worked in a vegan restaurant looked like that DJ guy, Moby? And everybody laughed. Um, Gilbert Godfrey was mine because I was telling a story. We were covering a political topic. It might have been the NSC Lavalin thing. But I was saying you got to be really careful about political comedy. Political comedy is hard to do um, because you got to get it out uh, right off the bat, I learned this back in the day from Gilbert Godfrey, who said, you gotta make sure you get your political joke in the first five minutes because then everything is Clinton like sex and Reagan is old. And I said, based on that line, you know, when we interviewed him, the SCTV thing Ed did make, this is the worst misrepresentation of all. Okay. The place we were performing was this place called the rock pile which is named after Mel's rock pile, which was an old SCTV sketch named af uh, inspired by the precursor to Electric Circus on City TV, where we used to work, a show called Boogie. So it was the City TV connection that Ed was, was talking about to just let people know a little bit of the history. So we were talking about the history of, of our careers and we were talking about, you know, vegan stores in the past when I used to be vegan. Um, and so at telling, giving the audience historical references, informing them of stuff that happened in a specific period of time is referred to as vice as outdated pop culture references, again, completely erasing my participation from the whole thing. I am telling you right now, Ed did not say the Gilbert Godfrey and Moby lines. I did. This is how sexist this coverage is. This guy took words out of my mouth and put it into Ed's and they seek to judge me. Do not interview a feminist and then pull this crap and expect not to get called out on it, that, that is the height of just male entitlement and patriarchy. And you know, all those things that Vice is known for, this is that in spades. Vice actually expected to take words out of my mouth and I wasn't gonna say anything about it. Or maybe they expected me to get mad and go all crazy and get them more attention, which is which is hatchet job journalism and clickbait if there ever was something. But, you know, I can't see how this makes them look anything but bad since they cater to the woke that they are literally stripping me of my words to focus on the male part of a comedy duo. And this photo was their idea, by the way, editing French fries. I just want you to know they came up with it. But they bring up the, when we spoke briefly before the show, I asked him if he's ever gonna put down the cigar and pick up a vape. He sternly answered no. Of course, this is why. One of the um, influences, one of the inspiration for Ed's look is The Thing, which was of course in the Fantastic Four, Jack Kirby, Stanley. Um, Ed doesn't vape. That's not Ed. 
Ed's a cigar smoker. That's kind of the whole idea. Also, do you know how heavy vapes are? You could not have a vape in the sock puppet's mouth. Like, it's just impossible. It was a stupid question. So that's the background there. Despite this, some critics feel he's more relevant than ever. Oh, and it's a link to another site that says Ed's super relevant. Whoops. To some degree, it makes sense. If you're going to joke about societal taboos, or some may feel you're crossing the line, why risk being pilloried? Just get a sock to tell those jokes for you. Wait, you're, you're breaking character voice now, man. Like you're talking about Ed, 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 nobody else exists. And now, okay, who is the sock telling the jokes for? Oh, the creator. Okay. Um, considering he's more politically charged than used to or interested in uh, than some used to. I, this is a terrible sentence. Most of his answers were more inclined to listen to Ed than Steve. BS. BS. We were always political. Always, always, always political, especially on much music. We were advocating for LGBTQ acceptance before there was a Q or a plus on that term. Ed did the pride parade. That was a big step. He did editorials, editorial, get it, about how people should embrace gay people, should be, people should be more accepting, nothing for you to worry about. That is incredibly political. We did a lot of get out the vote efforts because it was a youth channel and the youth vote tends to be very, very weak. Ed was always political. Anybody who thinks Ed wasn't political wasn't paying attention. And then, oh, I finally show, oh, I, I should say, I just want to give credit to my husband. Oh, just get a sock to, to tell all the jokes for you. That shows no awareness of how hard it is to do comedy when you can't see the crowd and you can only half hear them. Part of my job is to be his eyes and ears and let him know when something's going on by describing it to the audience. Like for those of you who can't see this, there's a lady down here with blonde hair and she's doing this. That's not just for the audience, that's for him because he can't see anyone. He's in a box. So... It drives me crazy because I know how hard what he is, what he's doing is for people to just strip all that away and act like he's somehow hiding behind a puppet. The reason he, it's a puppet is because he was actually doing like political debate shows at a time and he couldn't go on camera. So he made a puppet real quick for this other show on cable access and it just happened to take off. There was no intent to hide or do anything like that. It was an accident. And it's actually very hard to tell jokes where you can't see anything at all and you can't hear very much either. So again, this is just a completely uninformed opinion. And then there's stuff that after we've just been beat up, oh, suddenly I come back. So I figured I'd ask this new Ed along with Leanna, why? What's the point of all this? Why come back at all as a puppet from the 90s? I wasn't a puppet from the 90s, but Oh, finally I exist after you've stolen my jokes and acted like I wasn't there. But I want to show you guys, this is something, this is the only thing. Um, uh, you, you can read it, talks about, we talk about, you know, the, the Chong Sum, the, the Chinese dress garment. I actually gave the history of that. You know, oh, the crowd's so white. They didn't, they, I always ask, do you guys want to hear about the history of this dress? And they say yes. A bunch of horrible white metalheads. They were interested. Um, but, you know, this, this whole thing, um, for the one thing I wanted to get out in this article, the one thing I hope they printed is right at the end. So I feel mission accomplished. But after all this article, listen to my first answer. So what then do you hope will come from these talks you're doing? Well, it's not talks. It's comedy. Okay. It's, it's you know, um... But what do you hope will come from this? Me? Oh, I mean, the people will have a good time first and foremost, seeing that they learn a bit of stuff, you know. Um, but, you know, people are learning things, people are laughing, and people are feeling a little bit more relaxed on hot button political issues. But at the end of the day, it's about entertainment, people just coming to have a good time. And there really is nothing deeper than that. And Vice seems to miss that. And, um, then, uh, you know, the, they finally use a picture of me. At least it's not a horrible picture. But, uh, you know, and then, you know, why do you, what happened? They finally talk about one of the nuanced pieces of the show where they don't define what Chong Sams are. They're those Asian dresses that white people aren't allowed to wear anymore because white, other white people say it's cultural appropriation. But that's sort of the point. You know, it says, uh, when you were asking for crowd participation, oh, he acknowledges it was me 
asking for crowd participation here after earlier saying it was Ed, but there was a little bit of hesitancy before people were willing to engage. Where do you think that hesitancy comes from? And I say, well, there's the obvious. We were asking politically charged questions, right? What is political correctness? What is cultural appropriation? So the whole point of the experiment is to show that they're jargon terms, that there's actually no firm consensus on what they mean. And that's why they're used as weapons. It puts people in a mindset that they're going to be called on. They have the opportunity to speak. They're no longer a passive audience. I find it always takes a while for the audience to get into that idea. That's pretty clever, eh? After all this, you know... Um, and, and you can see what the interview is like. I'll let you read Ed's part, but you can see what the actual interview was like and how the tone was so different from the finished piece by, by this question here, you know, yesterday we spoke a bit that's referring back to the part that got lost because his tape recorder wasn't running and, and we helped him by giving him more time. Yeah, that yesterday we spoke a bit about how a lot of where that stems from is people curating the world that reflects the one they want to live in, you know, like Vice did with this piece, not willing to challenge their own beliefs, you know, like Vice did with this piece which is why context is so important, which Vice removed from this piece. But I'm wondering how you approach offering that kind of context to people who are skeptical of your own views. And I said, I think because we sort of had a point counterpoint, you should know, I, I don't think, I, uh, you know, I think I said, somewhat diversity in views is represented so Ed can be Ed and people don't feel like they're having an opinion forced on them. Oh, I did do the Black Panther thing. Even during the show last night, there was a bit of disagreement about things like Black Panther costumes and things like that. I think not only are we representing more than one view, but we're also showing how people can disagree without hating each other. I'm going to tell you guys right now the joke I told to a, a as they said, predominantly white room. OK, because we were talking about, you know, we, we, uh, Black Panther and how people, you know, white kids can't wear the Black Panther costume because it could be perceived as cultural appropriation and not all good and everything like that. And uh, that was one where instead of I was like, I got to I got to Like I had to play devil's I, I had to play devil's advocate on that one for the, you know, the 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 black people in the room that may feel like that's theirs and they want that to be theirs you know the same way that some people get upset when a character is is changed from a white person um so i said you know i, I gotta i i gotta give you the other side here we live in an age of you know invisible identities people have to come out being gay come out being trans you know they they have to finally get to the point that they're they're they feel comfortable enough to tell people and, you know, unfortunately, my friends growing up didn't have the opportunity to wait until they were ready to tell their friends they were black. They were kind of stuck with that from birth. They had to deal with it. So I'm willing to give them Black Panther cosplay. I said that to a predominantly white room. That is going to rustle some jimmies. You heard kind of an ooh from the crowd. Like it made them uncomfortable. And Vice gave me no freaking credit. For that none we know that goes over not so great with the majority of the room but there are a few people from a particular group who appreciate that counterpoint now of course ed's always the louder voice but of course they feel represented we didn't get any credit for taking those risks you know i thought it's pretty clever um but uh this is the part this is the part that i am very happy Despite all the hit piece, I am a tank. You guys know that, right? Like I just, no matter what. But this is the part I am so happy went in because this is just sort of my, my rebellion. My, I refuse to just let truth not happen. I'm going to tell a little bit of truth and I did it in vice. And this is where I feel like trap sprung got you. Okay down here. So how do you seek reconciliation if you've been cast out? I said, on the one hand, if you get ostracized by one side, you find another group. That's what I've been doing all my life. There are plenty of people out there. People are really down on social media, but social media allows you to connect to people all over the world. So when one door closes, another door opened. And I truly do believe that the people who aren't in the politics of ostracization, based on my own experience in, in even gaming, in gaming, okay, and being excommunicated by the so-called progressive feminists in gaming that people like that don't laugh. I managed to get that in. I managed to get the fact that the so-called progressive feminists in gaming 
are not the heroes of the piece, that they are ostracizing people, they are excommunicating people. I actually got that into Vice, guys. I don't think they knew what they were doing. Like seriously, because they were one of the most biased, one-sided bagman outlets during Gamergate. And they published that. I don't think they knew what they were doing. So that one was for you guys. That one was for, oh, there's more. Oh my God, they even printed more. Here we go. So, um, here we go. I'll, I'll back up. Um, based on my own experiences in gaming and being excommunicated by the so-called professive, progressive feminists in gaming, the people like that don't laugh. People like that control the dialogue. They become very brittle as things break, where people who are willing to have conversations will find each, uh, will find each other. Pendulums swing. You don't want to be too far out on a limb when it swings back because you'll be left behind by the next social wave. History has done that over and over and over again. I always tell myself if I want to be heard, if I want to be given a fair hearing, I have to do that for other people as well. If you approach it with that mindset, there's no way it can't be productive if everyone involved takes that view. In Vice. I got that in Vice. That one was for you guys. That one was for the gamers out there who felt like it was unfair, who felt like the treatment was unfair. And I don't have to agree with you guys to see you as people. It was just my little bit of, of reasserting reality there that someone said it in a, in a faux woke publication. And I think you guys can see how faux woke it is by the sheer amount of erasure they committed regarding my role in the show. If you read this piece, you would not know I was even there. How is that relevant in 2019? How is Vice more relevant than Ed the Sock, who people paid to see. Just saying. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. So we're going to get to the point where I say, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. I'm sure I'll take some shit from this, but I've already taken shit. They already wrote me out of the show in their version of events. What more can they do to me?